Buonasera, do il benvenuto a tutti a questa ripresa dell'attività del nostro seminario permanente di poesia che, come tutti sanno, è realizzato all'interno del seminario Laborlette afferente al Centro di Alti Studi Umanistici che ci permette queste, la realizzazione di queste iniziative. Eh, il programma attuale è il frutto del prolungamento a tutto l'anno 2021 del programma eh, pensato per il 2020. Abbiamo però dovuto recuperare eh, il primo semestre dell'anno scorso perché appunto siamo stati fermi per le cause che tutti conoscono. E, come molti di voi sanno, forse tutti, il tema scelto è un tema impegnativo e vasto al quale abbiamo dato il titolo e questo Giovanna lo sa bene perché ha partecipato a eh, tutte le trattative e gli incontri, abbiamo dato il titolo di Poesia Patria Mondo, un tema attorno al quale abbiamo raccolto, strada facendo, eh, anche a causa di queste more appunto di tempo determinate dalla pandemia, eh, varie disponibilità di collegamento da remoto e mh, la vostra presenza è anche la prova e, e il la testimonianza di questo appunto. Sono particolarmente felice di raggiungere un pubblico e persone interessate eh, che non sarebbero mai potute arrivare a Trento. Eh, questo tema è il tema che abbiamo appunto scelto, Poesia Patria Mondo, ehm, permette varie angolazioni o prospettive di indagine e ci dà anche l'occasione di rispondere o tentare, quantomeno di rispondere, a come dire, molte delle domande che da decenni, forse anche da, da, se, da un paio di secoli, poniamo alla poesia, alla sua natura intrinseca, Uh, al suo ruolo come esperienza o strumento di conoscenza, come testimonianza profonda dell'essere umano, del vivere eh, nella, uh, nel contesto e nel mondo di oggi. Uh, domande essenziali che siamo andati ponendo soprattutto alla scrittura, ai testi, al linguaggio poetico che mh, nella nostra presentazione, spero l'abbiate vista, abbiamo definito il linguaggio, la casa dell'essere. Domande poi che hanno attraversato le coscienze di tutti gli autori e le autrici, eh, poeti e poete della modernità. Eh, in, e diciamo eh, che oggi abbiamo l'occasione di eh, sentire le stesse domande e con risposte che si prefigurano interessantissime da parte della nostra relatrice di oggi che eh, lascio naturalmente Giovanna presentare con eh, la dovute informazioni e con la, eh, tutto quello che Giovanna sa più di me sulla nostra eh, davvero desiderata e attesa ospite. Allora intanto vi invito a prendere visione del programma che oggi in questo momento non posso Ricordare un ricco programma che perlomeno è stato definito fino al 24 di giugno eh, e con l'occasione ricordo anche che nei giorni 10-12 novembre ci sarà il congresso che avremmo dovuto celebrare e tenere l'anno scorso che è legato in qualche modo un po' recondito al tema eh, di appunto Poesia Patria Mondo e ha un, un titolo mh, un po' oscuro se vogliamo soprattutto nella relazione con quello che eh, stiamo facendo ed è gli oggetti della poesia quindi prego tutti di segnare nel calendario questa questa data, 10-12 novembre. Presto uscirà la call, ecco, for papers, che appunto, mh, al di là di alcuni ospiti a cui stiamo pensando, permetterà mh, a, a molti, eh, soprattutto i giovani, io spero, di eh, partecipare a questo congresso. Eh, termino perché ho già preso molto tempo e così come ho avuto occasione nello scorso autunno, quando abbiamo ripreso finalmente dopo più di sei mesi di sospensione di la i lavori, uh, ora colgo l'occasione per 
ehm, ringraziare davvero Giovanna Covi che ha permesso allora e permette oggi di eh, riprendere eh, queste, queste serie di incontri ehm, con la consueta, il consueto impegno ehm, la consueta, diciamo, eh, lungimiranza e apertura di, di sguardo che Giovanna ha sempre assicurato al nostro seminario. Eh, anche oggi abbiamo appunto la possibilità di ascoltare eh, una personalità, un, eh, un artista e una, una critica di grandissimo livello scientifico, appunto una personalità che senz'altro arricchirà eh, il, la nostra attività. Quindi ringrazio eh, Amin Addo di aver accettato questo eh, invito nostro e lascio subito la parola a Giovanna Covi per appunto presentare l'ospite e coordinare l'evento. Grazie a tutti e a te Giovanna. Grazie, grazie Pietro, sempre generoso, troppo generoso. Eh, grazie anche alle tante persone collegate, già vedo piccole immagini che mi fanno ritrovare amicizie e colleghe importanti. Thank, thanks all for being here, really. It's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to see you, at least virtually. And my sincerest thanks to Joan for participating in our department seminar on poetry, Semper, which for the sake of making her feel comfortable, I would describe uh, as a fruitful practice of creolizing various poetics, uh, academic discourses and languages. Indeed, I cannot find a better way of introducing Joan other than by emphasizing that her work uh, Her work as a historian, as a playwright, a poet, a literary scholar, and a publisher, as well as a committed citizen, has always been carried out in the name of creolizing. As a founder and director of the Center for Caribbean and Diaspora Studies at the University of London Goldsmiths College, she has turned an academic space into a hotbed of creolization through the practice of discourses uh, articulated always on the edge, the edge between the academy and the community in Southeast London, between the Caribbean and its diasporas, between the greater and the lesser Antilles, between artists, writers, scholars, not only from the Americas and Europe, but also from the Asia Pacific region and from Africa. The center has always been a buzzing, but has always been buzzing with so many languages and accents. Uh, uh, the many Caribbean languages, uh, Spanish, English, French, Papiamento, Haitian Creole, Dutch, and also Arabic, Hindustani, Chinese, Japanese, mixing with the different Englishes spoken by people from many continents. And the Caribbean tongues uh, carrying memories of Amerindian namings uh, and African speech uh, have often characterized music and dance performances at the center. The center has been a magnificent forum of vital exchange and collaboration precisely because it has always translated the literary into the political and the ethical. So much so that among uh, the numerous affiliations, uh, uh, the one with the University of Trento should not surprise. John Animado's uh, opera Libretto Inda, or she who will lose her name, was published by our department in its first edition, while Joan's Mango Publishing in London issued the Trento Projects on Caribbean Scottish Relations, uh, which I coordinated with Carla Sassi, and on interculturality and gender. And when the Greek crisis began to devastate the European Union, that was before the Brexit, uh, and the other blow now, the pandemic, it was with Joan that Lisa Marchi and I rushed to Athens to work with Mina Caravanta on the special issue of synthesis, perspective from the radical other. Convinced that the crisis urgently called for that cultural creolizing that the center had always promoted. And so many theses on Caribbean literature had sprouted 
inspired by the activities of the center from Finland to Greece, from Spain to Italy, Germany to the UK. Joan Animado has relentlessly never allowed Caribbean literature to become a mere academic discipline, thus turning it into an empowering tool for actions of cultural resistance against the racism, xenophobia, and sexism that devastate our world. Comparably in the Caribbean and in Europe, because the Caribbean is always here and there. So her inter talk on poetry, uh, motherland, fatherland, and world will certainly help us see things uh, otherwise, uh, moving us from Cuba to Grenada, from Jamaica to the USA. I'm sure that uh, she will enable us uh, to conceptualize uh, the father motherland uh, in different terms. Uh, my experience with Caribbean literature has always been an epistemic revolution. I won't take time to quote uh, her publications uh, ranging from the literary to the historical to dramatic, of course, to, to drama. Uh, also the performance of Imo India, Imo India is important. And the numerous uh, literary studies, you have them, uh, if, you, if you hooked up on this Zoom call, you have read uh, the presentation and I'm really happy to just uh, give her the floor to give, deliver her lecture entitled Metaphors of Strength in Women's Poetry of uh, the Americas. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, ciao tutti, which is about the extent of my Italian, even after all these years. <laughs> and uh, greetings, everyone. It's good to be with you, uh, if not in Trento again. Uh, my warmest thanks to the organizers, uh, especially uh, to Pietro and Giovanna for inviting me again to Trento uh, and for persisting with this project despite our hyper real and deadly COVID realities which are ever present in the background. Of course, I would have preferred to be with you in the flesh, but here we are meeting anyway, albeit virtually, and um, we're indeed grateful for that much. I hope you enjoy the presentation. It's certainly a pleasure for me since I'll be sharing some of my favorite poetry with you. To think together today about metaphors of strength, I'll be drawing on poetry by women of the Americas. This broad sweep, the Americas, allows me to include both my research interest in Caribbean women's writing and your request to include US poets. Altogether, five poems will be discussed and I hope we'll have time for them all. Uh, they are, and we, we have that on the slide if we can find it. They are Lorna Goodison's For My Mother, May I Inherit Half Her Strength. So it's the ne next slide, yeah, outline, yep. Lorna Goodison's for my mother, may I inherit half her strength. Uh, my own poem, Grenada Beat Trinidad, Nancy Morahan's Mother, Jane Cortez's Bumblebee, You Saw Big Mama, and a brief extract from Claudia Rankine's Citizen and American Lyric. I begin with Goodison in the Caribbean by reading some of, half of, may I inherit, uh, for my mother, may I inherit half her strength, which is taken from her 1986 collection, I'm Becoming My Mother. I should say uh, also that my approach to the selected poems is less that of a poetry technician and more that of someone who reads poetry for pleasure and who sometimes, though not frequently enough, enjoys the luxury of bringing 
poetry into being. Yes, of course, I share Audre Lorde's position that poetry is not a luxury, but I also know that for many black writers, especially women, poetry can be very much a luxury. Well, Goodison was born in Jamaica in the Caribbean. And when I say the Caribbean, I want to ask you to think about both the region and the Caribbean Sea within which one finds a range of islands, spaces once doubtless attached to the landmass that is currently referred to as North, South and Central America. Jamaica was, one, was among the first islands in the region to have been claimed in the 17th century for Britain. Since the islands and, main, and mainland both share not only the geography, but the same European colonial history, I refer to Goodison and the other selected poets as of the Americas, a term drawn from the 19th century poet and visionary Jose Marti. The term has been extended more recently in the UK, for example, through pedagogical practice referred to as teaching the Americas. For Goodison, painting and poetry have been lifelong passions. Her book covers usually incorporate her art. And I just hold this up so that you can see, this is very much one of her, the, the way in which you will see her, her book covers. Uh, her decades of rich and varied Caribbean poetry have been honored at home and abroad. Uh, in 2017, she was appointed Poet Laureate of Jamaica. She won a Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize in 2018. And in 2019, she was awarded the Queen's Medal for Poetry. The Queen's Medal for Poetry, yes. And we'll be talking about colonialism. Um, Goodison's publications include the memoir that's called From Harvey River, A Memoir of My Mother and Her Island which was published in 2007. And although the poem that I've selected for you is a long one, I think it's still important that we hear some of it. So I'll read the first half. For my mother, who uh, may I inherit half her strength, is a section that we'll look at particularly. My mother loved my father. I write this as an absolute in this, my 30th year, the year to discard absolutes. He appeared, her fate disguised as a Sunday player in a cricket match. He had ridden from a country 100 miles south of hers. She tells me he dressed the part, visiting dandy, maroon blazer, cream serge pants, seam like razor and the berry and the two-toned shoes. My father stopped to speak to her sister till he looked and saw her by the oleander. Sure in the kingdom of my blue-eyed grandmother, he never played the cricket match that day. He wooed her with words and he won her. He had nothing but words to woo her. On a visit to distant Kingston, he wrote, I stood on the corner of King Street and looked and not one woman in that town was lovely as you. My mother was a child of the petit bourgeoisie studying to be a teacher. She oiled her hands to hold pens. My father barely knew his father. His mother died young. He was a boy who grew with his granny. My mother's trousseau came by steamer through the snows of Montreal, where her sisters, Alberta of the cheekbones and the perennial rose, combed Juliet back streets with French turns names for Doris's wedding things. Such a wedding Harvey River Hanover had never seen. Who anywhere had seen a veil 15 Chantilly yards long and a crepe de chine dress with inlets of silk godets and a neckline 
clasped with jeweled pins, and on her wedding day, she wept. For it was a brazen bride in those days who smiled, and her bouquet looked for the world like a sheaf of wheat against the unknown of her belly. A sheaf of wheat backed by maidenhair fern representing Harvey River, her face washed by something other than river water. My father made one assertive move. He took the imported cherub down from the heights of the cake and dropped it in the soft territory between her breasts and she cried. When I came to know my mother many years later, I knew her as the figure who sat at the first thing I learned to read, singer and she breastfed my brother while she sewed, and she taught us to read while she sewed, and she sat in judgment over all our disputes as she sewed. Okay, I'm going to pause there, and I'm hoping that you'll be so intrigued, you'll be searching for Lorna Goodison's poetry. In this eulogy or praise song to the mother, the focus of the poem turns on the line, when I came to know my mother many years later. At this point, the I perspective disrupts the poetic narrative of romance to install the image of the mother as experienced or known by the daughter. I knew her as, is emphatic in the knowledge that it carries of the mother figure admired for her enormous strength, parenthetically highlighted in the title of the work, May I Inherit Half Her Strength. It's the domesticated practice of sewing that becomes a signifier of strength and drives the meaning of the poem. It is this figure stitching pieces together, the pieces necessary to make a whole garment or to mend one that would clothe her own family, members of other families maybe, that comes to dominate the poem. Everyday acts matter as she attends to individual members of her family, breastfeeding the infant, teaching the young learner, disciplining those who need it. The mother's strength lies in the steadfast manner in which she tackles all the demands that would open up possibilities for the next generation. Her children, regardless of her own disappointments. What Goodison renders is a fragile domesticity not to be taken for granted. Caribbean women's poetry is contemporary poetry, which comes into its own as a body of work well into the 20th century. The reasons for this paucity or late publishing are to be found within the conditions of Atlantic slavery and colonialism, which brutally, brutally severed Africans from their lands and cultures and transplanted them for the purposes of labor in the Americas. This bitter history concerns us today because it created conditions which directly impacted upon writing or lack of it, and therefore cannot be ignored as we return to the image of the poet's mother, a 20th century woman who despite oiling her hands to hold pens, must turn those hands to more immediate skills. Both the oiling and the sewing obliquely reference prevailing socio-historical conditions relative to black women's lives in the Caribbean. Also in the frame is the father who, quote, barely knew his father, quote, and instead grew with his granny. And there is the blue-eyed grandmother positioned within a kingdom, each evoking historical his associations, some of which are further developed in other poems in uh, Goodison's collection, in which she is much more broadly revealing of this history. To assist our awareness of those conditions that would negatively impact upon the production 
of Caribbean writing well into the 21st century, we'll briefly turn to the colo some colonial maps, which um, I'm directing you to because they are a student's friend. These are the famous Wikimedia Commons maps. I've already traumatized Giovanna about them, but we can lose them. Thank you very much. And we see, I just want to draw your attention to uh, 1600, for example, and we, we are focused on the United Kingdom, but look at France and Portugal and Spain and look at how they begin to, uh, their colors begin to spread out into the Caribbean region or the, the region of the Americas because that process of colonialism has been established. Can we, can we just see the, the next one? But I just want you to notice the way by 1660, the spread has moved, not just from the Americas, the region of the Americas, to Africa, to India, and then on to the next one. By 1754, we see, and as you go through those maps, which I invite you to do on your own, uh, you will see that the way, the way in which uh, the expansion of the Britons of Britain's empire between the 17th and the 19th century um, is particular uh, is of particular significance for our discussion, and how it builds to the especially to the to the 19th century. Specifically, we should be aware that to speak of colonialism is to reference the world post 1492, in which the Genovese Cristoforo Colombo, or Columbus, as he came to be called, financed by the Spanish crown, set out to find the country of a people referred to as Indians. By all means, ask yourselves why? Why was this venture so pressing at the end of the 15th century? Secondly, the race to colonize others, people who do not look European, peaks in the 19th century, when much of the globe is colonized. And thirdly, British colonial expansion, beginning with Barbados and Jamaica, Goodison's Island, in the 17th century, escalates in the 18th century, and peaks in the 19th century. I'm foregrounding these details because there is a marked tendency to gloss over colonialism in one breath in our classrooms, and I quarrel with that. We escape to post-colonialism with or without a hyphen, I would argue, far too quickly. Sadly, colonialism is the brutal space within which we must first contextualize uh, Caribbean writers, writing. Goodison and I were born in colonies, British colonies. Goodison writes of her, quote, sound colonial education, end quote, in which she was taught, quote, history, exclusively British and European, end quote. It was the same for me and many writers we prefer to categorize as post-colonial. There are complexities there that should not be dismissed. Uncomfortable as it may be, colonialism is the crucial first context for getting to grips with the Caribbean and its writing or absences when we note them. So, a, a moment or two of history. Some definition should serve our thinking together. Colonialism may be defined as the practice of subjugating a people or peoples and assuming the right to dominate them 
systematically limiting their rights and traditions, thereby circumscribing their potential to reach meaningful self-realization within the society or nation state. Colonizers then typically, typically function as state-sponsored imperial agents. The English-speaking Caribbean, of course, that concerns us relates uh, to England's or the British Empire. The West Indies or English speaking Caribbean was part of that empire until well into the 20th century. And I just want us to flip to the other, the next um, slide, if we might, Varna, just uh, so that you see, just to the next uh, PowerPoint slide, not, not the map, if you can get there. Uh, just, it's just to see that, uh, you know, it's still, yeah, the, the one with a bit of passport, that's it. Yep. You can just about see the date on the, um, on the little map. And it's 1961. This is my passport. British subject citizen of the United Kingdom, the first passport I have. I am a British subject citizen of the United Kingdom and colonies, okay? Like it, uh, the, I can't stress enough that the colonies did not just disappear uh, in the 18th century. So to turn back to that critical moment of colonialism, um, I wonder if it would help just to take you through a brief visualization exercise, if you will. So it's the first light of day. Before you, you can barely make out what seems to be a large field. It's actually an intensive labor settlement, a plantation. Enslaved men, women and children summoned, was that a bell you heard? Was it a conch? They file in through the early light and begin to labor in the fields. There will be a short break for lunch when it's far too hot for anyone to do anything outdoors. But these laborers will finally be dismissed at dusk. Whips. Men with whips oversee their work. Whips constitute the main form of punishment and whips are graded for severity of punishment. The daylight is filtering through and it's getting hotter. Your eyes search to see where those laboring bodies came from. You won't see their accommodation. That's mostly hidden, out of sight. You will see their bodies though. After all, it is only their bodies and their labor that matter. These are bodies, black bodies, some bought and sold already many times. You won't be able to get too close today, but at the slave market, you're free to inspect each one as you please. Well, I threw you into that exercise and you might ask yourselves later on, were you able to, to, to visualize the enslaved bodies? To ask yourself also, what sort of gaze was yours? Empathetic, disinterested, puzzled? Key to those bodies was the understanding that the enslaved was held to be property and not human. The West's history of perceiving the black other as not human is exceptionally important. And as you will have seen from the murders igniting the recent Black Lives Matter activism, this humanism, dehumanizing, will resonate right down to the present day. The offspring of the enslaved and women occupied a specific role in this regard belonged to the buyer and the enslaver. 
The enslaved's original language, cultural practices, and religion were forbidden on pain of the severest punishments. These included limbs being cut off, lynchings, and so on. We're reminded by Caribbean historian Hilary Beckles that the enslaver, the enslaved never reproduced their numbers, and that when slavery ended in the 19th century, slave owners were compensated for the loss of their profit in the bodies of the enslaved. Well, from our hopefully heightened awareness of meanings of colonial slavery in Jamaica, as in the rest of the Caribbean, we might just turn again very briefly to Goodison's mother figure, whose ancestors, or some of them, had certainly survived. Fast forward to post-1835, during Britain's more paternalistic colonialism phase. So first we have the brutal possession phase, then the settler phase, and then this third paternalistic phase. By the paternalistic phase, trading in human bodies had ended, Britain had been maneuvered, into freeing its enslaved peoples, and mass education was beginning through what was called the Negro Education Grant only in 1835 to 45. The funds were specifically aimed at promoting religious and moral education, and the grants were made to religious bodies in the UK who would send Christians as untrained teachers to indoctrinate the recently subjugated. Held against the backdrop of colonial slavery as we now visualize it together, the figure of the poet's mother, a privileged, quote, child of the petite bourgeoisie, studying to be a teacher, end quote, oiling her hands to hold pens, tells us much. In the 20th century, and despite her privileged position, such a figure would have been among the first generation of black women to glimpse the possibility of a role that would place her both away from physical laboring and from full domestic responsibilities. Further, Doris's bourgeois trappings with its luxurious wedding serves as a reminder that the enslaved was generally not allowed marriage their bodies being considered the property of someone else. The missionaries would later instill a sense of propriety antithetical to that of the colonizers and insistent upon Christian marriage, whereas the colonizers would not permit marriage of any kind. Goodison's mother figure with nine children and an ongoing struggle to provide for them in light of class expectations for decent clothes, Cambridge exam fees, and so on, cannot engage the desired career teaching. Moreover, she certainly could not hope to write. Instead, she sacrifices towards conditions that would create possibilities for her offspring. The mother's strength lies in harnessing the wherewithal to resist the persistent socioeconomic realities that have plagued the region and especially adversely impacted upon life chances for girls. Now I've dwelt on the background for Goodison's poem because it serves for many of the poems uh, within this group. In light of the question of the fatherland that this series of presentations ask, it is notable that the father in Goodison's poem is from an unnamed country, quote, 100 miles south of hers, end quote. Also the blue-eyed grandmother signals only an implied paternity linked to the colonizer. In case the socio-historical meanings uh, remain unclear, colonial slavery systematically destroyed the family systems, including marriage, 
of the Africans they enslaved. At best, colonialism offered a paternalistic value system dependent on gross misrepresentation and an enforced amnesia concerning the land of the Africans whose bodies they had enslaved. As a result, ideas of fatherland in the context of the Caribbean are not readily embraced. Okay, I turn to our next poem. Uh, for this next poem, Grenada Beat Trinidad, the cricket playing that I've so far ignored in Goodison's poem now takes center stage. Where are, whereas in Goodison's poem, cricket is, uh, as Claire Westall argues, a zone of male participation and female observation. In the cycle of poems that together make up Janey Cricketing Lady, this is not the case. Janey Cricketing Lady is my second collection of poems. The first is Haunted by History. For reasons that have been repeated by people like me, Black, Caribbean, first generation educated women, it was not possible to be a writer full time. Despite this, I came to occupy a privileged position in terms of writing. And in this collection or cycle of poems, which was intended to be a big poem, I set out to write a version of my mother's story. I say a version because I was acutely aware that this was not the version that she would have told. Indeed, she rarely talked about herself. In many ways, I knew her most intensely in my early teens when we lived in very respectable immigrant poverty in London. The lack of space that we inhabited in London, in direct contrast to the space I had known in the Caribbean, forced me eventually to look closely at this woman who was my mother and to reassess who she was and what she was doing with her life. I noticed at one stage that London appeared to be shrinking her and that she seldom talked about home. However, when she returned, there was space for my questioning and for this project. I kept asking, therefore, until the other Janie emerged. Much of what I discovered about her, I found out when I went back to visit on holidays once she had returned to Grenada, our island home. Against all odds, and especially because Janie is a young black woman of the interwar years in the Caribbean, cricket is not a sport that welcomes her. The gender divide in the sport at that time was pretty much rigid. As you are doubtless aware, cricket is a sport very much linked to the British Empire. It was for a long time considered a gentleman's sport. It did not accommodate women except as spectators. I've not researched the history of cricket as such, but for those who are interested, you might want to see Claire Westall's paper, which is called the Her Story of Caribbean Cricket Poetry, published in Sport History in 2009. Grenada Beats, uh, Beat Trinidad is one of the series of interconnected poems in the cycle as a whole, Janie's cricket player playing functions as gender transgression. Westall tells us that, quote, a dominant strand within Caribbean cricket poetry is the praise poem, celebrating or commemorating the actions, achievements, and qualities of an individual player or team. Often these are heroes of the male West Indies team, end quote. In this light, Janie Cricket and Lady is the praise poem that would never have been written for a woman of her time or for her. Except for the section Grenada Beats Trinidad that I'm going to read, Janie is not heroic. She she does not get the opportunity to be the shero. She does succeed in getting her father 
to use up some of his land as cricket pitch. And by this means, she does loosely organize a motley group of players. She does gain a place in the women's team, which gives a bit more exposure during the years of World War II, when the men had largely gone abroad as volunteers. Finally, though she succeeds in trans transgressing boundaries, she perhaps fails in many areas, including relationships, careers, and so on. However, although the dice is loaded against her, she's headstrong, she's decisive, regardless, and therein lies her strength. In Westall's words, Janie is presented as, quote, one of the few isolated heroes of cricketing difference, performing herself, her gender, and her cricketing talent on the field of play, initially by playing against local boys and later as part of organized women's teams. Cricket playing serves then as a metaphor for performing or rather transgressing gender barriers inextricably bound up with colonialism. Momentary successes might be gained, like the victory of this particular inter-island match that follows. And here we have Grenada beat Trinidad. Doubts laid like lumps in the sieve of their lives that year. Doubtless, much was due to insistent news of allied fronts, blockades, campaigns. But that was not why her dada, sighing, searched the sky for signs of rain or calculated the shillings and pence of cane crops balance sheet of bad weather. Nor why big sister daily sought the tiny post office on the cliff turned postwoman while waiting a promised placement as a nurse. And Janie Pact told herself to ignore the bubbles rising in her stomach. And though offered, she declined her sister's trousers taken in at the waist. Instead, she traced her own path as batsman number four and a bowler of medium pace as Nellie, who would marry her brother, sat tense in the wooden pavilion at San, San Fernando. And what an ardent, bubbly band of women, the Grenada team. Perhaps too many came from St. George's, warned those from Birch Grove, Hermitage, River Road. But touring the island, the young women, cricketers, serious gigglers, astonished crowds, won the series three games to two, transforming San Fernando into special memory space. The cloudless day she made 87 runs not out. Few knew of the accident, the team's loss, the boarding house steps that snapped and felled, both captain and vice captain. How her teammates pleaded with her, Millie and Mina injured. Oh God, Janie, play for me today. Play for me, you hear? And so she played, her concentration bright as a new sixpence. She rocked back on the back foot, stunning spectators with fours. And how she lashed that red leather, punching the ball off the offside, gravitating to her knees to make a sweep and place the ball sweet between fielders. Bowling at that steady, persistent pace, she struck a ladder bless all. Pretty girl with your nice, nice hair and that intensity of purpose. They say she didn't smile once under the hot sun with that ball in your hand, running up to clean bowl, some unknown woman's daughter. She says, you think it easy chasing runs under a hot sun? It's only looking easy, but girl, that last ball before lunch, always welcome. While Janie triumphs in this section, in the next, the cricket bat is gathering dust under the bed and Janie faces the prospect of motherhood. In accepting motherhood but not marriage, she faces a dilemma similar to the mother figure in Goodison's poem. 
she must sacrifice her own hopes and what might have been for her in order to open possibilities for the next generation, her children. Once again, the mother's strength lies in harnessing whatever is necessary to resist the persistent socioeconomic realities that I've discussed in relation to Goodison's mother figure. The life chances for girls of the next generation are specifically implicated. Thus, Janie sets cricket aside, takes up menial jobs, and repositions her hopes, alert to the possibilities that her personal sacrifice might open up for her children. Now to Nancy Morhon. By the time I came across Nancy Morhon's poetry, it had become painfully clear to me how little interest British publishing houses had in black voices, particularly poetry. I did not understand then how much the publishing of literature was tied to market forces. I had noted, however, that Goodison's remarkable I'm Becoming My Mother had been published in London, not by a mainstream publisher, but by a small independent black press. In 2001, alert to mainstream publishing's inhibitive and exclusive practices, I published Nancy Morahan's Black Woman and other poems through the small press that I set up initially with first time writers in mind. Nancy Morahan was no novice, but already a celebrated poet in Cuba and abroad with a number of awards. When Nancy attended the London launch of what was and still remains her first published collection in the UK, despite her celebrated status and her many translations, she was introduced by Caribbean scholar Conrad James, who emphasized what he called her sheer artistry, exemplified through her meticulously working of imagery in her poems. Morahan began by her reading, began her reading with the poem Mother. She said, quote, I would like to begin with a poem to my mother. It is dedicated to the memory of my mother. Once upon a time, it was not dedicated to her memory, but to her life. I always begin my readings with this poem. I'm quoting Virginia Woolf when she says, quote, behind every woman writer, there is the ghost of her mother, end quote. Nancy read in Spanish and I read the English translation by Jean Andrews. This poem formed of 16 lines is so packed with rich imagery that it can be visualized as a painting. My mother didn't have a garden, only cliff edged islands floating under the sun on their delicate coral. There was no clean branch in the pupil of her eye, only lots of garrots. What a time that was when she used to run barefoot on the whitewash of the orphanages and she didn't know how to laugh, and she couldn't even look at the horizon. She didn't have the ivory bedroom, nor the wicker furnished drawing room, nor the silent stained glass of the tropics. My mother had her singing and the scarf to rock the faith of my insides, to lift up her head of an unheard queen and leave us her hands like precious stones in the face of the cold remains of the enemy. We see the cliff edged islands, the sun and the coral informing her landscape, seascape. We puzzle over the damaged eyes of the little girl. Unlike Doris and Janie of the previous poems, 
the focal figure is no privileged black girl. Barefooted, destitute and homeless, even laughter is alien to her in the whitewashed orphanages that have sheltered her. There is much that she didn't have. Yet despite this, for her children, she finds a voice with which to sing and soothe them. And she grows adept at the use of her scarf as a baby carrier that would hold them safe and allow them to be rocked as and when needed. For the poet, this mother becomes and remains an unsung queen. Like Doris in Goodison's poem, Morahan's mother figure leaves her children her hands that will turn to whatever is necessary for them, that will create possibilities. I move now to Jane Cortez's Bumblebee, You Saw Big Mama. Uh, from her collection that's called Somewhere in Advance of Nowhere and was published in 1996. I wanted to place a poem by Jane Cortez in today's mix. And it is not a typical poem of hers in that so much of her poetry uh, was uh, ecologically based and concerned with protest and change. Born in 1934 in Arizona, USA, Jane Cortez emerged as a black woman poet concerned with resistance and activism. Jane Cortez took her maternal grandmother's surname. Cortez is not a Euro-American name and this clearly mattered to her. She was a prominent member of the Black Arts Movement, which sought to wrest black writing from white establishment normativity and dominance to make black culture matter in the aesthetics of black art. In Cortez's words, the Black Arts Movement was particularly, quote, interested in exploring African languages, forms and cultures. We wanted to change the system secure the future and move forward, end quote. Her focus then was in black culture transnationally. So that in 1991, uh, she established with the Ghanaian writer, Ama Atta Aidu, the Organization of Women Writers of Africa, which promoted key conferences bringing black women together. African art forms, were central to her creative output. And a musician herself, the blues became crucial to her work. For this presentation, I wanted to pay attention to singing. Bumblebee, You Saw Big Mama is highlighted as another praise song poem. The poem celebrates a largely forgotten but enormously talented black woman singer, the self-taught and exceptionally gifted blues artist, Big Mama Thornton. And I forgot to put a link to Big Mama Thornton. So I hope that you will be able to look her up. Uh, she's, uh, her work is available on YouTube. Big Mama Thornton had a blues song called, um, Big Mama's Bumblebee Blues. One line central to Big Mama's Bumblebee Blues is, quote, you stung me once and I've been looking for you all day long. Clearly revenge is on her mind. Cortez's praise song and blues response to Big Mama's is written a decade later. I should emphasize that orality and performance are key to Cortez's oeuvre. She embarked on her own publishing and recording to ensure that her work was heard as well as read. So, Cortez's 
Bumblebee, you saw Big Mama. You saw Big Mama Thornton in her cocktail dresses and cut off boots and in her cowboy hat and man's suit as she drummed and hollered out the happy hour of her negritude, Bumblebee. You saw Big Mama trance dancing her chant into cut body of a running rooster, scream shouting her talk into flaming path of a solar eclipse, cry laughing her eyes into circumcision red sunsets at midnight bumblebee. You saw Big Mama bouncing straight up like a Maasai, then falling back, spinning her salty bone, drying kisser of music into a Texas hop for you to lap up her sweat, Bumblebee. You saw Big Mama moaning between ritual saxes and carrying the black water of Alabama blood through burnt weeds and rainy ditches to reach the waxy surface of your spectrum, Bumblebee. You didn't have to wonder why Big Mama sounded so expressively free so aggressively great. Once you climbed into valley roar of her vocal spleen and tasted sweet grapes in cool desert of her twilight, Bumblebee, you saw Big Mama glowing like a full charcoal moon riding down Chocolate Bay Road and making her entrance into Rock City Bar Lounge and swallowing that show me no love supermarket exit sign in her club ebony gut. You saw her get tamped on by the hellhounds and you knew when she was happy. You knew when she was agitated. You knew what would make her thirsty. You knew why Big Mama heated up the blues for Big Mama to have the blues with you after you stung her and she chewed off your stinger, Bumblebee. You saw Big Mama. Well, I just, you know, it's fun. I just uh, love that. Um, so in, in uh, Cortez's poem, the Bumblebee is directly addressed. The praise song element comes strongly through that repetition, you saw, you saw in each but the penulti penultimate stanza. In the first stanza, Big Mama's larger than life performance costume of disparate elements is the focus. In the second stanza, it's the spiritual qualities associ associated variously with the rooster scream or the solar eclipse or the circumcision red sunsets that the bumblebee saw or rather should have seen and heeded. And the third stanza is the extremes of Big Mama's cultural reach from Maasai to Texan that ought to have been taken note of. And then, then there is the ritual involving Alabama's blood, all of which should have been warning enough for the bumblebee. In the final stanza, Cortez reinforces what should have been expected by any observer of Big Mama. And she does so by repeatedly warning, you knew, which crescendos through four lines so that Big Mama chewing off his stinger becomes an inevitability as the poem closes. As I said, this one is fun. It's blues humor played out. To the bumblebee, the poem says, you saw all this and you still messed with her? Or fool you. On another level, the poem pays serious homage to the blues singer whose talent unschooled she honed herself so that it proved to be formidable. It's Big Mama's singing and more than that, her consummate performativity that is celebrated in this poem. 
If you're interested, this is one you would need to go back to through performances, both Big Mamas and Jane Cortez's, because she responds uh, in song as well. And finally, and I hope we don't have to rush this, but finally, Claudia uh, Rankine. Uh, Rankine's multiple award-winning citizen and American lyric provides the last, but certainly not least sample of our metaphors of strength today. Rankine's 2014 prose poetry collection, Citizen and American Lyric, has decisively broken with the past in important respects. It has done so by a timely opening of questions of form that in many ways and I know that there will be many people who will argue with me about this, dethrones verse patterning, however short-lived that might be, to privilege prose, exposing at this moment when black voices can no longer be fully kept out, that poetry is art after all, and all artists, including black ones, can influence how it's made. Rankine has also broken with the past by placing center stage, the writing of race, which the publishing market has been insisting does not sell. And here I put in a plug, the subject of literary art and the market really needs to be researched in the university we are naively unaware of the forces of the market. Moreover, Rankine has placed along the sacred text, poetry, images, visual images, images not made up of words. <sighs> I shudder to think what the poetry purists are really saying just now. The world-renowned sporting figure that Rankine's writing presents afresh is that of Serena Williams. And that's precisely where I would like us to stay for a few minutes. With Serena Williams, a figure of tennis excellence familiar to all of us through the media, the television specifically. In this text, we become immersed in poetry that is representing the successful black woman already refracted through the eyes of the media and also simultaneously through an artistic consciousness questioning contemporary response to race at a point in our transglobal moment when we still find it difficult to talk honestly about race. At risk of stating the obvious, I'll say anyway that that difficulty stems from colonialism as we've already discussed it, and which is now bound up in guilt and denial. Okay, a fragment from Rankine. First of all, uh, page 25, she asks, what does a victorious or defeated black woman's body in a historically white space look like? And she's already forcing us to look through the eyes to look again through the eyes of the media. So we already see in the figures here, she says, Serena and her big sister, Venus Williams, brought to mind Zora Neale Hurston's, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. Uh, we already see in the figures of Serena and Venus 
through the prism of the media in, quote, historically white space. And then again, a moment, as she says, interviewed by the Brit, Piers Morgan, after her 2012 Olympic victory, Serena is informed by Morgan that he was planning on calling her victory dance the Serena Shuffle. However, he's learned from the American press that it is a crip walk, a gangster dance. Serena responds incredulously by asking if she looks like a gangster to him. Yes, he answers. All in a day's fun, perhaps? And in spite and despite it all, Serena, Serena Williams blossoms again into Serena, Serena Williams. When asked, asked if she's confident she can win her upcoming matches, her answer remains, quote, at the end of the day, I'm very happy with me and I'm very happy with my results, end quote. Serena would go on to win every match she played between the US Open and the year-end 2012 championship tournament. And because tennis is a game of adjustments, she would do this without any reaction to a number of questionable calls. More than one commentator would remark on her ability to hold it together during these matches. She's a woman in love, one suggests. She has grown up, another decides, as if responding to the injustice of racism is childish and her previous demonstration of emotion was free floating and detached from any external actions by others. Some others theorize she's developing the admirable quote, calm and measured logic, end quote, of an Arthur Ashe, who the sports writer Bruce Jenkins felt was quote, dignified and quote, courageous in his ability to confront injustice without making a scene. Jenkins, perhaps inspired by Serena's new comportment, felt moved to argue that her continued boycott of Indian Wells in 2013, where she felt traumatized by the aggression of racist slurs hurled at her in 2001, was lacking in, quote, dignity and, quote, integrity and demonstrated, quote, only stubbornness and a grudge. What really works for me, and I think is important, is the way we are not just reading the poet's view, we are being asked to look through several uh, layers The, there's the, the kind of refraction that happens uh, all the way through. And finally, uh, I want us to, I'll just read the tiniest section on page 36, in which we meet Caroline Wozniacki. Now that there's no calling out of injustice, no yelling, no cursing, no finger wagging or head shaking, the media decides to take up the mantle when on December the 12th, 2012, two weeks after Serena is named WTA Player of the Year, the Dane Caroline Wozniacki, a former number one player, imitates Serena by stuffing towels in her top and shorts, all in good fun, at an exhibition match. Racist, question mark? CNN wants to know if outrage is the proper response. And if we could just play that tiny little clip. So we see the imitation. Okay, thank you. We can pause there. 
why rankings break matters, and I'm bringing it to a close, is that as a corpus, and given that poetry is a byproduct of a process of education, such opportunities by black women begins to open up the art form. In truth, in the writing of poetry, there's always a harking back to Emily Dickinson. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. But how slant does it have to be? Sometimes in the past, any truths concerning race could hardly be found at all. So slant were they. About the poets presented also, other than the signifier black, this is a group of multiple and hyphenated identities, though shaped and still marked by European colonialism and slavery. As I've tried to indicate, these are indeed poets of the world. They might differently be referred to as profoundly intercultural poets. That is to say, Specifically due to a brutal colonial history, they discover themselves positioned between cultures, heirs to a difficult and complex politics of location and its poetics of relation, as Glissant refers to it. We can be more bold, I think, in opening up the world and here I do mean world of poetry. Uh, and we can remain relatively secure in the knowledge that the forms that emerge can always be wonderfully varied. Poetry is not fixed. As is properly the case with any art form, poetry is alive and always emerging. Hopefully today's selected poetry has opened each of us up to the world a bit more. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Joan, <laughs> for really opening up uh, certain academic definitions of lyric. <laughs> um, I would really like to give the floor to whoever wants to jump in because I see so many, so many people who are much more experts than me <laughs> on what, uh, on some of the poets that you have mentioned. I, I claim some expertise on your own poetry. <laughs> But not, but not on uh, on Morahan and uh, and even Claudia Rankin. I had the pleasure to work uh, uh, with a student on her who appeared at a certain point. So may I ask uh, if somebody would like to interact with Joan? Uh, I'm not going to keep you hostage for a long time. I know we all get tired by looking at these screens, but we have an opportunity of uh, exchanging uh, a couple of ideas. Mina, is that, uh, yes, please. You need to unmute yourself. Hey. Hello. Hey, my friends. It's so nice to be on board. So nice to see. It's me. <laughs> before, all, all before, before, I, Trento. <laughs> before I mute myself, uh, Mina from Athens. Okay. Uh -huh. Mina Peramante. I am Mina from Athens in a quarantine, very much like everybody else on board. And this is um, not so much a question as a comment that I would like to share with all of you and our dear friend and colleague John. Um, I was very intrigued, uh, John, by uh, certain motifs in the poems that uh, you've shared with us today. And one of them is obviously that of the family that, you know, as um, first of all, as uh, um, the family as the remains 
or of a colonial structure that has destroyed the the families from which you know the the enslaved um have been wrenched from so obviously there is this foregrounding of a family as an a, a western type of ideal that these broken families that are the remainder of this colonial politics cannot you know um cannot sort of match because obviously you know the the broken links and ties uh, have affected the way these you know post-colonial families will develop and yet in the poetry we see in the various figurations of the mother uh, affirmations of the family as a different type of community that resists you know this colonial politics against of course and often under very extreme and dehumanizing conditions or social economic conditions that are very difficult to fight against. So one thing that I was very intrigued by is a history of the family that seems to be uh, portrayed and questioned in these poems. And I know that you have been working on this project and I want to hear more of your, you know, of your take on how this poet on how these particular poems and other, you know, uh, works of art and the historical research you have done um, question, you know, this um, representation of the family as part of the nation, as part of Western politics and civilization that seems to uh, then function as a measure of or for the civilized that somehow the formally colonized or, or people who have been, who have emancipated themselves under extremely difficult conditions cannot appear to, cannot seem to match somehow mm -hmm. developing or formulating families that don't meet the paradigm mm -hmm. of the, you know, patri patriarchal bourgeois family that is at the center of the nation. So I, I was very taken by how the figure of the mother in all these poems and embodies a kind of resistance, but also a kind of affirmation or an articulation of a different kind of community. And the other thing that intrigued me is how these particular poems, or at least the passages that you've selected, embody this in the form of, in, in their form as poems. They embody this idea of rapture, but also, and fragmentation, but also articulation of another unity or another uh, sense of belonging and community by breaking the traditional forms, mm -hmm. by breaking away from the traditional forms, mm -hmm. the traditional form that we've been trained to call poetry or the poem. Okay, so this is, this is you know, maybe I hope that I have followed you uh, closely, mm -hmm. but knowing that um, you've been working on this, I want to, you know, hear about what you know, how, how far your research has gone, or no, your thinking, not so much research, has gone yeah, in that respect. You're right. Uh, and of course, uh, Imoinda embodies just that, doesn't it? Uh, that, um, that whole question of how the family, uh, family patterns were, were broken, uh, and how it is that women managed uh, to, I don't want to say quickly, to, to gradually e evolve uh, another system that, that allowed that kind of uh, community to support children. Uh, and it's, it is a, a difficult one because very little has been done about this and it's only really the gap in, I think first of all, I noticed that there were so few mothers in, in the fiction. Uh, the children were often not with the mothers. And of course, in the so-called um, post-colonial fiction, you know, Merle Hodges, uh, 
Quick Rat Monkey, for example, um, just almost every other novel, the, 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 the young person was always having to leave the home or there was never placed within the home that you could see, uh, which, which of course served to highlight the difficulty without actually exploring it. Always there would be this, this gap. Uh, no, no, there is no mother, there is no family. And I think in a way reading across from the Caribbean literature to, uh, to literature from black writers in the US uh, shed enormous light on what was happening because here was a gap and and also the you know it's uh, i quoted that little bit from lorna goodison who uh said who reminds us that it was all about colonial education so this was not the gap uh people were not being educated within a literature of the nation, they were being educated within a literature of empire. Hodge and so many others would say, you know, the, the real world was the world of Britain. Uh, Andrew Levy, for example, in Small Island, um, Within that, there's a section in which uh, Gilbert, is it Gilbert? In which, uh, I think it's Gilbert, one of the characters anyway says, you know, you can, here I am, I can tell you anything about, about Britain, but can you tell me anything about Jamaica? But, but more importantly, he can tell you anything about Britain, but he can't tell you very much about Jamaica because that was not, where the education process was focused. And, and there is the sad joke from every other Caribbean uh, poet about learning about daffodils before learning about anything local. So by all means, learn about Wordsworth and how he writes about the landscape, the flora, fauna, whatever but not about the place. The, the Caribbean was never real. The, the, the education system was meant to civilize and to have people behaving like new versions up to, up to a, a certain extent, to a degree, um, new versions of English folks, of course, one could never aspire really to be English, but uh, the, the, the mimicry was, was important. So there wasn't the process of examining those gaps of noticing that there were those gaps. It is only gradually being teased out. And when we search and we see how few, um, how the, the relationships, the family relationships are always for. Of course, in writing, there's always the search for the drama and if everything was working beautifully, there would be nothing to write about. But uh, there is certainly, it has taken this long for people to discover those gaps, to question those gaps. You know, uh, they were told that there was, you know, that's that Africa's were all savages and they didn't have any of these systems. What we do know now is that some of those family systems still operate very strongly in African countries. 
So what what happened was that disruption uh, in the Caribbean and other places. I know that that doesn't, in a way, uh, begin to answer your your question. But I think that when we search the literature, we find that it's that those questions are only now being worked through. May I uh, try to uh, keep the time? I see. Uh, Uh, two people would like to ask questions. Lisa Marchi and Sandro La Barbera. Uh, and we need to compact time a little bit, I'm afraid. Uh, so please uh, go. Maybe can you entertain two questions together? Would that be? I shall try. Okay, let's try that uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Lisa and Sandro. So that we give a short to other people. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for being here. It was a pleasure seeing you and listening to you. Um, with, your with your poems, you made us travel from place to place. <laughs> so my question is related to that. Uh, in particular, if you could please um, elaborate a little bit on the relation between the body and the surrounding environment, uh, since you showed us, uh, you took us from built environment to the natural environment. I was wondering if we could say that nature is uh, less perhaps influenced by colonialism, by patriarchy than a built environment, or if this is just a wrong impression. <laughs> Thank you, John. Should I be asking my question now? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for, for this talk, Professor. Uh, I'm a Latinist. I teach Latin literature here. So my uh, yeah. question comes from a position of complete ignorance and I acknowledge my lack of education in all of these matters. Uh, but because I am a classicist um, and also someone from an island that went somewhere uh, that was um, a content that was very um, hostile to me as someone from an island. Um, all of that kind of um, came together. What, what I was reading, I also reread on my other computer here, um, the Goodison poem. Uh, I was wondering if it is my own colonial thinking uh, to be reading some of her lines there as kind of classical and inspiration and that this figure of the mother that sits and uh, sews um, is very much in line with what the sort of uh, equally patriarchal um, societies uh, from ancient times expected women to, to be like. And that is as at the center of the action of sewing with a machine that's called a singer. <laughs> um, and that kind of um, triggered memories of characters like Athena, a goddess that is that presides over sewing, presides over singing, presides over reading, which is what she says she learned to do from her mother. Even the the, the blue-eyed grandmother, to me, I then understood from your talk that it is a sign of uh, the person having been enslaved, but it, it immediately struck the sort of memory of um, the, the gods being weird to the Greek poets because they had blue eyes. Uh, is there anything there? Is it altogether, again, Eurocentric um, uh, thinking? Uh, to, to address your question, the, to begin by addressing your question uh, first, the, the colonialism, you know, the, the business about the colonial education is that this is the foundation. There, there is no, there is no, no contrast in a way. This is how we, we all grew up with classical education, whatever Britain did, thought was desirable. It was a, a very, it was not a very uh, deep education, they took from the British edu 
education system, all the elements. So this is what, when, when Giovanna refers to the creolization, the creolization is about all of those elements being brought together um, or being forced together. So if you go to school and you first learn Greek tales, you have to read Greek tales and you have to read uh, Lamb's Tales of Shakespeare and so on. And then you speak in a, in, in a language or, uh, that is not um, accepted beyond the school door. You are mixing all of those things together. So, so there is the, the, the mother figure, Penelope, whatever she does, this is, uh, there are in other poems um, that by Goodison, just those kinds of references. They are there, but what, what Caribbean uh, writers have had to do is to or, excavate again, as Joni Morrison says, you know, their experiences and, and the significance of their experience, uh, experiences against this kind of monolithic teaching, which um, I, I've referred to as, uh, as a kind of denial all the way through. So that has, that has been the whole process. And then to go to Lisa's question, if I'd read you almost any other pay, uh, poem by Jane Cortez, for example, you would see that she's steeped in um, concerns about ecology. So it's not separated at all there uh, in terms of uh, her poetry. And in, in increasingly, the, the writing against the kind of um, the, the difficulties, the traumas of colonialism, uh, I'll, I'll point you, for example, to uh, Texaco by, um, what's Texaco's, Patrick Chamois, so Texaco, and you, you know, that, that, that narrative is largely about the problems, the ecological problems. It's, it's based on, it's built on that. Texaco is a shanty town that arises in an, an urban area. Uh, we, increasingly, again, you have writers like Jacob Ross, for example, he's writing crime fiction set in the Caribbean. But at the ecological level, we see, we see the ways in which community works to uncover crime rather than the detective figure working on his own, but also the ways in which the, uh, the, the natural world is polluted by political ways of behaving and so on. So I think what we begin to see is this emerging and remember how new Derek Walcott who said not so very long ago, this is the literature in its babyhood. Yeah, so, so uh, we always need to be watchful about what's, what else is emerging. So the, the, the question of the body and the environment, they are also key questions that are picked up on uh, again and again by writers. Yeah. If, uh, if you're wanting me to suggest any um, uh, writers, then I'm, I'll be very happy to, to do so. I'll have to ask you to do it in private. Yes. Because <laughs> I have uh, one or two. I'm very, very happy to welcome Livia Bellardini back to Trento from Rome. Hello, everyone. Yes. Working <laughs> on a doctoral program. 
So yes. welcome back. No, just one question more and then let's see what time it is too. Yes, I will yeah. be very fast. I'm sorry to keep you, but no, yes, I'm a former student of Trento and I'm currently located in Rome. And I actually have a question and, and a comment if, if I can. And I would like to begin with the question that stems from some of my own doubts actually. It's a practical question um, that is mostly, that mostly concerns how to approach poetry and lyrics today. Um, I've, of, I've often read on um, a narrative track that people tend to take uh, and that basically involves treating the lyric as if it were fiction and trying to reconstruct um, the speaker somehow from, uh, uh, from the tellings that he's sharing. And connected to this question is another one actually that concerns objects in poetry because I've always seen poetry um, as frames of life somehow and narratives as flows of life. So I'm wondering if sometimes objects in poetry um, instead of breaking this narrative path somehow allow for some sort of stillness in poetry that is, uh, I believe, fundamental. And this brings me to the comment specifically on Claudia Rankin's lyrics. Um, as you have mentioned, we have many images, uh, many visual images that are not only words. And it seems to me like these images somehow recall that same stillness that objects can in lyrics. And I'm wondering if it's a pertinent uh, comment. And also, as you mentioned, sorry, another comment, <laughs> as you mentioned, um, Wordsworth before, um, he, he said that um, the language and the language that conveys feelings in poetry, um, well, he actually speaks about poetry itself as the overflow of powerful feelings recollected into tranquility. So I wonder how this recollection takes place. Is, is that what changes from poem to poem and from, I may also like to say narrative to narrative. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions there. Yes, I, I, can, I can read some again, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, um, so, I mean, in terms of the question of objects, yes. much depends on the kind of poetry you're, you're reading, right? Uh, and we, we saw that these, the, the selection that I offered are, each one is very different in, in, in its approach to poetry. So uh, if you're interested in objects, then, then you need to look at your selected poets very carefully. And uh, for example, Morahan, uh, if I wanted to find that kind of stillness, I would, be look I would want to look at some of her poetry because um, she does that. It, she comes from a different tradition uh, and uh, objects are very important in that tradition. It's not, it is and is not the same for Caribbean traditions, I want to say at this stage, but that that tradition is always, it's always emerging um, and it's open to lots of different influences. Mm -hmm. Certainly Caribbean poets have been very interested in having that colonial history reveal itself. So, um, probably more than most literatures, you will, it would be inescapable to read uh, Caribbean writing without having to negotiate history. That's 
because of the nature of the circumstances of that literature. But it, it's not, for example, Nancy Morhon has a, a collection that is called Polished Stone, Polished Stone. Um, fascinating, but it, it's not the, it's not the, it's not the poetry that I would immediately uh, be going for as a writer, coming from a, a slightly different uh, tradition within the Caribbean. And we have to remember also that um, when I refer to the Caribbean, I was mostly referring to the Anglophone Caribbean. It'll be different again, you know, in, in other parts of the Caribbean. So um, I think you have to, have to ask yourself what are your priorities and then make your selection from there so that you can do those comparisons uh, and decide if, you know if, if we really are going to explore those quiet moments if that is the real thing that you're interested in then your selection has to be made with that in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, because I've noticed that there is not only one way to, to read a poem, and many times, even if we, mm, we are advised to leave this narrative track somehow, however fragmented, it must be reconstructed. So mm -hmm. um, I, that's what I've noticed in that, what I've had trouble with reading poems, especially, but thank you very, very much for this comment. It is certainly a matter of priorities when you approach a poem. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joan, of course. First, we kept you here forever. <laughs> everybody must be getting a little tired. Huh? I'm, I'm sorry to, to suggest that perhaps we should close here unless there is somebody who wants to at least say ciao Joan or something like that. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the idea was, uh, the idea was to close around 6.30 and it's already 7 p.m. Uh, but of course there are 1 million things to talk about and Livia brought up the idea of Poetry and objects, of course, uh, you know, keep in mind uh, <laughs> the Semper <laughs> Congress coming up. Um, thanks, thanks to all for being here. May I just uh, one minute uh, thank uh, uh, my first year students uh, uh, who have, uh, who are just beginning to study Toni Morrison with me, have had no other exposure to American literature yet. They've lost it, I see, so congratulations. And I'm sure that what, uh, you know, what kept us, what kept them with us was, uh, was this idea of the strong mother. We are learning from Toni Morrison that uh, there is no way to rewrite the history of slavery without focusing on the on the strong, on the strength against all odds of uh, the slave mother, against all odds, of course. And it is there and it defeats uh, any even distant idea of uh, uh, engaging a psychological interpretation of the mother figure in those narratives. Uh, there's a lot of history there. So thank you, thank you very much. Marlene, would you like to say something? No, I see, I can't handle the chat. As my students know, I can't handle the chat and, and your images, because I like to see your faces. I just wanted to say thank you for organizing and it's so lovely to see you. And Ms. you, Mina, yeah. and you, Lisa. <laughs> we miss you, Marlene. <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> Carla, ciao Carla. <laughs> oh, ciao, ciao. È stato bellissimo, mi ha fatto piacere vedere. Oh. It's wonderful to have you back. <laughs> uh, if only virtually. But <laughs> as soon as the plug is over, I'll call you personally. Um, <laughs> that's a promise. <laughs> mm -hmm. Joan, great to, say, to see you.
Miss you. Lovely to see you too. You're 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 looking as though there's no lockdown whatsoever. It's all as though you're as free as a bird. Yeah, yeah. When it's a virtual background, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's all virtual. I'm real, but the background is virtual. <laughs> Okay. Bueno. Bueno. <laughs> bueno. <laughs> what a hon. <laughs> it's been with us too. A little Cuba. <laughs> Ciao. Grazie a tutti.